Father, you know what this day is in store for this day. And so before and as we begin, we ask that you would allow us to be mindful of your presence and your movement in our days. Particularly today as we learn a little bit more about ourselves and how you have wired us. And today as we learn a little bit more about how we need one another. And Father, as we learn more about ourselves, we do learn more of you through your word, through our encounters with others, and, and, and as we learn how you view us. So I pray that you would allow us the humility to learn, the humility to see how we need one another, and the ability to work alongside one another, viewing each other as made in your image. Father, thank you for that honor and that privilege and the opportunities to live that truth out. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's just say we had a party. And let's just say that in this party, we needed to have a committee, a group of people to get together and actually organize what our party would be for, the purpose of the party, where it's going to be, who would be invited. And if you wanted to be that part of, let's say, the planning of this party, would you just raise your hands? You could see yourself as being that part of the party. OK, good. Um, there are others that, let's say, at the party, they would arrive at the party sharply on time, and they would go over probably to the refreshment table and just make sure that there are enough cups, enough drinks, enough snacks. And at the end of the party, this particular person would probably walk around with a trash bag, wanting to make sure that everyone puts their trash in the right container and that the place is left more tidy, more clean, than when they had arrived. They're probably the ones with the vacuum cleaner at the end, making sure everything is neat and tidy. If you are that person, would you ki kindly raise your hand? Okay, very good. The third type of person, at the party would want to make sure that everyone, absolutely everyone felt welcomed at the party and that they would be spoken to and just, and just communicated that the party just would not exist without you. And if you were that person, um, you would probably, if you were invited to two parties that night, would go to the second party and again, make sure that everyone felt welcomed and that they were part of the, the family and they're the reason why this party would be such and will be such a, a success. So if you're that kind of person, would you raise your hand? Yeah, good. The fourth of four type of people at this party would be that person who is at the party and they stay pretty much in the same area until one moment, someone walks in through the door and that person is probably someone they haven't seen for a long time, perhaps a day. <laughs> and they proceed, they proceed to, they proceed to then spend the whole rest of the time at the party with this person, wanting to know everything about their day, what they did, how they felt about it, who they saw, what they read. And they uh, would then proceed with spending the whole time with maybe one or two people, the whole entire time at the party. And if you're that kind of person, would you raise your hand? Yeah, good. Okay, where's this first group who are my planners? They were getting together. You know this group, this group likes to plan. This group likes closure. This group likes challenges. And so what we do is we call them our lions. They're like the take charge kind of people. They like closure. They like challenges and they like closure. They like finding solutions. So we uh, kind of categorize you as the lions. You'll find out with all of these animals that you have all the animals in your life. My kids are, my children are all four animals. Um, each one of them is one. And so when we get together, it's like a zoo when we get together. <laughs> the second group, the second group here, you know, let me ask you, um, have you ever stepped into a garage and suspended from the top of the, the ceiling of the garage is a string? Have you ever seen that? Mm -hmm. And at the bottom of the string is a what? Okay, what is that tennis ball hung from the ceiling there for? 
Ah, right to that point. So as a driver, I drive right to the tennis ball, right? What happens if I go beyond that tennis ball? <laughs> I'll crash and hit something, destroy something. So that tennis ball has been strategically placed so as not to destroy anything if you drive, the driver drives up right to that tennis ball and it hits your windshield right then, then and there, right? Okay. Who put that tennis ball there? The beaver. A beaver put that tennis ball there. <laughs> they have calculated exactly where that tennis ball should be hung and how long the length of that string. There's a lot of strategy and, and calculation that went into this to hang that tennis ball from the ceiling of a garage. Now, um, beavers, are those types that when they purchase something from Ikea, they actually read the instructions. <laughs> right? You actually read the instructions. So you guys are our beavers. This group over here doesn't read instructions. <coughs> we figure that uh, as soon as we open a box from Ikea, it should pop out and be readily already assembled. It should just kind of pop out, fold out, and be ready to use, correct? All right, these are my, um, my folks who are what I would call our otters. They are people people. They love being around people. They're energized by being around people. In fact, if you have an appointment to meet a friend to work on a project in the library at 4 o'clock and you leave at 345, you will probably be late getting to the library. Why? Because every room on your door on your dorm floor that has an open door is an open invitation to come in and say hello. You'll be greeted by and you will greet many people along your path to the library so very, very likely you will be late for your appointment at 4 o'clock because you have interacted with a number of people along the way. And again, every open door on your dorm floor, floor is an op open invitation to please come in and visit me. Make sense? Okay. Our fourth group here, our fourth group here are very loyal friends. They're the ones who want to sit with maybe one or two people. They're very, very loyal friends. Everyone needs someone like this in their lives. We call them our golden retrievers. They are very, very loyal friends. They are very, very good listeners. In fact, if I were to say this to um, our Golden Retrievers, do you remember when you were in elementary school and your best friend moved away? That was a tragedy. That was so sad. Um, in fact, even by mentioning it now, you st it kind of uh, stirs up those emotions. I remembered when my best friend moved away and I wasn't able to see him or her anymore. You are very loyal friends. Um, you are emotionally invested in, a relation, in relationships. And that's why when your best friend moves away, it was very, very difficult. It was a hard time uh, for you as your friend moved away. Great listeners. Um, they like to be one with one in conversations. And your relationships mean a lot to you. You remember people's birthdays. You remember things about people. Um, that oftentimes um, others will forget. So what we have here are the lions, beavers, otters, and golden retrievers. I have a couple of slides that will show you how we kind of break this down. There are some technical terms to, to each of the personality types. And what I'm going to show you are some weaknesses and some strengths of each personality type. Lion, beaver, otter, golden retriever. I'd like for you to jot down one strength and one weakness as you're going to be um, talking about this in your groups when you meet day after tomorrow on Friday. All right? Jot down one strength and one weakness. Even though your particular personality type may not be shown up at a particular time, I want you to also think about this. There are those in your family that are other personality types. They have strengths and weaknesses too. A sibling, a parent, a relative, a best friend, and they will have different personality types, again, with strengths and weaknesses of each one. And so it's helpful to see, oh, that's why that person does that. Or they really like that kind of an environment, and I don't offer that kind of environment. Or I can be um, helpful to this person um, by exercising blank um, for their personality type. Does that make sense? Okay, so here we go. 
Again, jot down one strength and one weakness of each of your, um, of your personality types. You've got personality. Here are the lions. Um, each of the personality styles that we have here are, are illustrated with a couple of illustrations first, and then we'll get into some strengths and weaknesses. So here are our lions. You'll notice just uh, even from it, the illustration, they like to kind of direct things um, and cast a vision. These are the lions. Here are some strengths. They do like to get immediate results. As I mentioned earlier, they like closure in things. They like solving problems and taking charge. Um, challenges energize lions. They like the challenges because they feel that they can offer some solution. And the challenge of um, finding a solution is very satisfying to them. They like many new and varied activities. They like difficult assignments. They don't want anything too easy because they want to grow from this experience. They also like the freedom to act and to have control over situations. They also want direct answers from others. If you give an, a lion a wishy-washy answer, it frustrates them to, to no end. Well, maybe, uh, maybe not. A lion needs direct answers so that they can solve the problem. That makes sense? So lions, as you've jotted down perhaps one strength that you've noticed from the screen, here are some weaknesses. Because they are such take charge people, they can have a tendency to be insensitive to others and a little impatient. After all, they have a solution and they want to get to that solution so that they can move on to the next challenge. Um, they may take on too much because challenges are so inviting to them. They may take on more challenges than they are able to address. They ca can be in a, uh, inattentive to detail. After all, they're more of a visionary. They have the big picture. And so those fine details, you can already, already pick this up here. They're going to need someone else to help them with those um, details. Um, they like an arena to act free, more freely, and so they're going to resent some of the restrictions. Don't, don't put too many restrictions on a lion. Uh, lions need others to help them become more sensitive or alert to being more sensitive to the needs of others. And they need others around them to offer those details and the facts that they need in order to solve a problem. They have opportunities to trust God for patience. Sometimes the, the task will over, uh, outweigh um, perhaps a need to talk with someone or to find out how someone is doing. The sensitivity to the needs of others we can trust God for and to be more flexible. Um, it's not my way or no way. That's the lion. Here are a couple of illustrations for the beaver. You'll notice in these couple of illustrations that there aren't a whole lot of people around the beavers. They like to work uh, and, they do, uh, and they accomplish their work very well uh, by themselves. Give them an idea. A lion perhaps has already given them an idea, a vision, and the beaver will go ahead and make that happen. How will it happen? Ask a beaver. Here are some strengths of, uh, that beavers have. They are very orderly, very conscientious. They are disciplined, and being, um, they are very diplomatic with people. They like to and enjoy being in an environment where they can concentrate on those details. They like a stable surrounding. If you give a beaver a job description that changes week to week, it will frustrate a beaver to no end. They need to know their parameters. They need to know um, the arena and the forum where they can work and work best. They like that exact job description. And they like the time to do things right. Make sense for the beavers? Yeah. It's funny being standing here. You can see all kinds of heads nodding. Yeah, yeah, that's me. OK, here are some strengths of a beaver. Um, and again, we all have beavers in our lives. And you can kind of look at this and go, oh, you know, my best friend, she's a beaver. Here are some weaknesses of, uh, that beavers have. 
We can be rather indecisive. Um, we overly avoid conflict. Why? Because this is the way it's always been done and this is the way it works. So if we just do it the way it works, then um, we don't have to have any conflict. Uh, being hesitant to try new things and uh, sometimes a bit pessimistic. Now let me ask you this. Most of you, if not all of you, have been to the Cheesecake Factory and have seen that menu. What would a, uh, a beaver do with a Cheesecake Factory menu with so many options? Get the same thing every time. Why? Because it's proven true and the Cheesecake Factory is very good at always giving that high quality dish the same time every time. Give that same menu to a lion, what would the lion do with that Cheesecake Factory menu? What, what would the lion do? Try something new each time? Try something, question mark or period? Period. Yeah, you try something new every time. After you've kind of looked into it and kind of thought, hmm, oh, this would be good for, um, you know, for the party or for the group that I'm with. All right, good. All right. Um, beavers need others for quick decision making because they will think and mull over it. Probably one of the mantras for a beaver is what if? What if, a, what if we go camping? What if a bear shows up? What if we run out of water? What if we run out of food? What if we run too far? What if we run out of gas? What if we don't have a <laughs> cell phone? Um, does that make sense? So we can kind of get caught up in um, all the possibilities and not being able to make um, a quick decision. And we have opportunities as beavers to trust God to be more open and self-confident and to be more optimistic. Well, perhaps it can be done another way. All right. Here are a couple of illustrations for our otters. You'll notice that they multitask. Um, they are energized by being with people. Here's another one. They probably know more names of people on campus than others. They just, and they will stop and have uh, brief discussions with them. Here are some strengths of an otter, sanguine. They are optimistic and enthusiastic. If an, um, if an otter gets hold of an idea that perhaps a lion has given them, that otter can promote that to a great number of people. So again, we can begin to see why and how we need one another. They like um, and enjoy making a good impression, a desire to help others, and they create an entertaining climate. It's kind of fun to have an otter around. Um, if you notice, uh, those who do the weather report on television, those are otters. They're not just giving you the weather, they're walking around and they're, um, they're pointing to things and they're, they're likely the ones who engage with the other uh, commentators or anchors on the, on the set. Um, they do uh, and are very personable and again, very enthusiastic. They like a friendly, friendly atmosphere. Um, they don't want to be bogged down with a lot of details. They like to have that freedom to explore uh, people and, and to learn more. Um, they like the public rec recognition of ability, the opportunity to verbalize and again to articulate well. They like positive in, uh, reinforcement and praise and actually I would add that to every personality style. And they have an enthusiastic response to ideas. And again, if a lion or a beaver, uh, if they have a great idea and it's looking good, if you get um, an otter to understand and, and claim that for themselves, that idea will then be um, perpetuated um, outside and to a great number of people. Here are some weaknesses for otters. Uh, we can sometimes oversell ourselves. Of course we can do it. Of course we can do a zillion things at once. Uh, we act rather impulsively. Sometimes we talk too much and we jump to conclusions. We don't think before we speak. We need others to help us follow through on those details, <coughs> like deadlines, and we need others to help provide concentration on a task. <coughs> we have opportunities to trust God for better time management and pausing before acting, actually thinking before we speak and act. The last of our groups is the Golden Retriever. 
and you'll see the one with one kind of relationships that golden retrievers enjoy. They enjoy just intimate time with others, getting into each other's lives, and really, really listening. Again, they're loyal friends, great listeners. And so, of course, this is going to show up in some of their strengths. Very loyal, very supportive, um, almost to a fault. But they are loyal, they are consistent, they exhibit um, great levels of self-control. Their ideal environment includes minimal conflict and security. They've invested in relationships. They are rather and can be a little territorial or possessive with their friends. Why? Because they've invested so much emotionally um, with that relationship. They like doing things the way they've always been done, just the traditional way of getting things done. Back to the um, the Cheesecake Factory menu, what would a, an otter do with that um, Cheesecake Factory menu? Different things every time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. My daughter, we were at Cheesecake the other day. My daughter, who's a, an otter, ordered a salad with a double side of this and not so much of this and avoiding this. Uh, just creative. <laughs> All right, good. Um, with a golden retriever, what would they do with a um, with a cheesecake factory menu? What would they like? What would they be like with all those options? Same thing, same waiter. Same waiter, right? <laughs> same waiter. Oh, I remember you from last time. The, so there's that relationship aspect. Okay. Now get a lion and <coughs> a lion, beaver, otter, and golden retriever at the same table. And they're ordering the menu. Can you see a little bit of frustration if you don't understand that, you know what, uh, a golden retriever will probably take his or her time a little bit longer with that. You'll probably just uh, bring up a conversation with the server, your hostess, find out a little bit about them, call them by name, right? Um, and so when, uh, it was funny, the last time I did this, uh, a friend of, or uh, um, a student sat uh, at their desk and said, that's why we had so many problems the other day when we were all ordering from a particular um, menu at a restaurant. That's why. Uh, not that it's wrong. None of these personality styles are wrong. But we're learning more and more about how God has wired us and then how he's wired us for community. All right, good. So you have before you, as we get a little bit more technical, Oh, I'm sorry, here are the weaknesses for the Golden Retriever. Um, resisting change, trouble meeting deadlines, um, being over lenient because they are so, um, well, they're so longing to, to be um, helpful and they don't want to rock the boat. And so they'll they'll swallow quite a bit, um, and again, almost to the almost to a fault. Um, if someone is hurting themselves, again, they may not want to uh, rock the boat. So they'll say, "Oh well, it's okay. You know, maybe we can we can try this." Um, acting very and, and being very gingerly as they they hold um, onto this relationship. They need others to stretch them toward a challenge and initiative and change, and we can trust God for, as a golden retriever, to face confrontation, that some things are not right, and some things can be confronted um, that are wrong. And increasing the pace, again, with that menu, they'll probably take a little bit longer um, with making that decision. All right, so everyone's kind of jotted down some weaknesses and strengths of our various personality styles. Now getting even a little bit more technical, um, you have done the young typology, no relation uh, with, uh, I do not have any relation with that. But uh, you have your young typology, you all have four letters, correct? Now I'm going to read something <coughs> to you and, um, and then pass something out to you. Um, and it almost sounds like a, 
kind of like a fortune cookie type thing. But if I read your particular um, combination, would you just raise your hand? I'll just read something um, very brief, and then I have something to pass out to you. Do we have any ENFJs in the house? ENFJs are outstanding leaders. You have unusual charisma. You make up about 5% of the general population, and you like things settled and organized. Do I have any EN, I'm sorry, INFJs in the house? Any INFJs, interesting. Um, INFJs focus on possibilities. They come easily to decisions. You make up only 1% of the population, so it's quite surprising to have so many in my classroom. Unusually strong drive to contribute to the welfare of others. How about any ENFPs? Any ENFPs? No ENFPs, okay? How about INFPs? INFPs uh, present a pleasant face to the world. They care passionately. Perhaps um, a word that would describe you best would be idealistic. You only make up 1% of our population. A profound sense of honor. You work well alone as well as with others. How about any ENTJs? Any ENTJs? None? How about INTJs? An INTJ are the most confident of all types. You make up 1% of the population, decisions come naturally, and you are not likely to succumb to slogans or watchwords. You think. ENTPs. Any ENTPs? How about INTPs? No INTPs? How about ESTJs? ESTJs are in touch with their external environment. You make up 13% of the population. Um, a descriptive word for you, are you is you are responsible. You like to see things done uh, and done correctly. You are loyal to institutions, work, and community. How about ISTJs? ISTJs are guardians of time-honored institutions. A word that would describe you would be dependable. You make up about 6% of the population. You are rather quiet and serious. Your interest, uh, you have an interest in being thorough and in details justice, practical procedures, and you have a distaste for and distrust of fanciness of speech, dress, and home. Any ESFJs? ESFJs are the most sociable of our types. You make up 13%, you're chuckling back there. Um, you make up 13% of our population. You're energized by interactions with people. Harmony is your key word. You are great nurturers of established institutions. You wear your hearts on your sleeves. You need to be needed, loved, and appreciated. And again, I would extend that to every single personality type. Any ISFJs? Okay, interesting. You make up 6% of our population. Your primary desire is to be of service and to minister to individual needs. You believe work is good. You are willing to work long hours. You are super dependable and seldom happy working in situations where the rules are constantly changing. ISTPs? I'm sorry, ESTPs. Any ESTPs? How about ESFPs? An ESFP radiates attractive warmth and optimism. You make up 13% of the population. You love excitement and create it wherever you are. You are the most generous of all types. Uh, perhaps a word that would describe you as performer. You do not mind telephone or, telephone or personal interruptions and you love working with people. ISTPs? ISFPs. ISFPs are more inclined to the fine arts. You're more of a spender than a saver and um, sometimes are seen as reserved and private. You have a remarkable way with animals. You are optimistic, cheerful, lover of freedom, wanting excitement. You are trusting and receptive. Now, as I've read that, perhaps you've thought, oh, I wish I knew a little bit more about my particular style. And so, AJ, would you start passing this, pass this back to the back row? And so all the extras will come back to the front. Would you pass that to the back? And so what you'll see um, are the combinations on this yellow sheet, the combinations of the personality types. And you will likely find 
your four letters or the combination of your four letters here. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 14 to 21. For the community of faith does not consist of one pattern of preference, but of many. If the INTJ should say, because I am not an ESFP, I do not belong to the community, that would not make it any less a part of the community. And if the INTP should say, because I am not an ESFJ, I do not belong to the community that would not make it any less a part of the community. If the whole community were an INFP, where would be the ESTJ? The ISTJ cannot say to the ENFP, I have no need of you, nor again the ISTP to the ENFJ, I have no need of you. What do you think of that version? <laughs> What's it saying? We all need each other. So again, glance over that yellow sheet, find yourself, but see how others complement your strengths and complement your weaknesses. Where you are strong, someone else is weak. Where you are weak, someone else is strong. I'll give you about 30 seconds to look at that. Did any of you find out a little bit about yourself? as you're reading particularly your particular square. Now the wonderful thing about doing this survey um, on humanmetrics.com is that it also gives you what the I and the N and the T and the J and the F and P, those kinds of letters, what they mean. So um, you know that, that website is, is very helpful in that way. Now how does this apply to spiritual formation? Yes, it's great discovering a little bit more about ourselves, but how does this apply to our own growth in godliness and how we grow more and more like Christ? AJ, I'm going to bother you again to send this back, and we'll see the extra copies up front. Thank you. The sheet I'm passing out to you, the green sheet, is something taken from um, another book and it's titled Finding Your Spiritual Path. If you look across the top row, you will find those very letters, the I, the E, the S, and the N, the T, and the F, and the J, and the P. Look at your own particular letters, and then look down that column. You will find an area that, uh, a way that you prefer. As an example, those of you who were uh, a bit higher on the E, or one who tends toward extroversion, you have a more of a prop you have more of a propensity toward action. One who has a leaning toward introversion will have more of a propensity toward reflection. As you're looking down the columns, can you kind of see? Oh yeah, that's what I favor. Can you see those descriptions in the columns? Now, how, do, how does this then again apply toward our spiritual formation and the way, the means of grace that God invites us to engage with Him in? If we tend toward extroversion, then the likelihood of our propensity will be toward action. So if there is a large group prayer meeting, we're probably going to attend that, or large group um, sessions. Something like going to a silence, and a silence and solitude retreat, where you're not allowed to talk, probably wouldn't interest you at all, correct? If you're tending toward action, something like silence and solitude isn't going to draw your attention. You're not going to jump out and say, sign me up. If I were to have a sign-up sheet for a retreat center or a, a going to a monastery to spend a couple of days where you are not allowed to speak, um, all those who tend toward extroversion will just kindly exit the room. Um, if you tend toward introversion, there's a part of you that says, yeah, I totally want to do that. That would be so neat. So that's why I need to pass out this third and final sheet. AJ, once again. And once again. Thank you. What the blue sheet does is it takes the last two rows on the green sheet and fills it out. It expands it and fills it out. So on the top of the blue sheet, what you'll find is your natural spiritual path, but also what's needed for wholeness. 
So as one that tends toward extroversion and perhaps toward action, we have to make an intentional effort to nurture the shadow side of our spiritual formation. So signing up for something or carving out time for silence and solitude, even though it's not our propensity, is something that we have to take an initial and intentional effort in finding and doing. Does that make sense? So I myself tend toward extroversion. But over the years, I have not become um, more introverted or um, or even grown in, in, uh, a propensity toward introversion. However, I have learned to appreciate the ways of introversion. So although God created me as one who tends toward extroversion, I've learned to really appreciate the times of silence and solitude, and I've gleaned that, and that has helped in um, becoming more and more like Christ. So as you learn more and more of your tendencies or the default you, the propensities, then we can better see how I can make intentional efforts to do um, and nurture the shadow side of our spiritual formation. And these sheets are for you to take with you. You'll probably want to spend a little bit of time just kind of reviewing them at another um, time. One of the main reasons I like to bring this up here in this class is that as we begin exercising the means of grace, we'll start with silence and solitude, we're gonna continue on with fasting, uh, prayer, confession. We'll, we'll enjoy and actually exercise a number of means of grace, eight altogether. As you begin to uh, learn more, read about these various means of grace and exercise them, there's a part of you that might say, oh, this is a little uncomfortable. And what that simply means is that's the shadow side of our spiritual formation, that we can take an intentional effort to exercise. So if you're going to feel, and if you feel a little uncomfortable with any of the means of grace, it simply means that's the shadow side of us that God is wanting to nurture and to cultivate a little bit more clearly. This will also help if any of you are leaders in a church. Now, if you are, let's say, a worship leader, and you want to break the congregation up to do something different on a particular day, and you want to break them up into small groups and spend some time in prayer. I've seen this done in, in uh, even large churches. If you do that, the golden retrievers will go, oh, this is wonderful. The otters, what are the otters gonna think? What might the otter think? We're gonna break up into small groups and we're gonna pray. Yeah, I'd be a little skeptical. Um, how long are we going to do this for? And can I jump around to other groups if I don't like my group? <laughs> so what the leader can do is actually put some parameters on this. It's a great idea to break up into small groups, but perhaps the leader being sensitive that there would be lions, beavers, otters, and golden retrievers in the congregation might say something like this. Prayer is really important in our communication with God. And in a few moments, we will break up into groups of three or four and spend two minutes in prayer. So already you're putting parameters up and you've lowered the, the potential anxiety for those who might feel a little uncomfortable as they turn, uh, tend toward extroversion or even introversion. You're giving them a, a bit of time and some parameters. You're giving closure and you're giving them the ability to still exercise um, an element of deepening a relationship. So as a leader, you mean, we need to keep in mind that in any congregation or any community, any large group, you're gonna have various personalities. And it's helpful to know how best might those various people with these personalities respond uh, to a given <coughs> task. Um, again, as it applies to our means of grace, Look forward to the ways that God is going to invite you to these various means of grace as he nurtures our and grows us as we grow more and more like um, into the image of Christ. He will use silence and solitude. He will use fasting. He will use prayer and he will use confession. He will use biblical thanksgiving and biblical hospitality, service and celebration. 
And as we exercise those and read on each one of those, you're going to see God moving and God um, shaping you more and more into the image of His Son. What uh, a neat experience to, um, to have in this class is you're actually able to experience and see transformation. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.